Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Are you ready to discover some niche business ideas that actually work? Well, it's time for a motivational kick to jumpstart your next big idea. Here's your host, Spencer Haas. Hey everyone, Spencer Haas here of nichepursuits.com and welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today it's going to be a really interesting show because we have a special guest with us. His name is Matt Paulson and his blog is over at mattpaulson.com. He's an entrepreneur, he's an aspiring author, and he's an ASP.net web developer. Uh, Matt publishes a daily investment newsletter to over 92,000 subscribers through his analyst ratings network, and he operates a network of financial news websites including AmericanBankingNews.com and AnalystRatings.net, along with a few others. He also has a few other websites that we will talk about just briefly, um, one of those being Lightning Releases, which is a press release writing and distrib- distribution service that he created to help out small companies, authors, and nonprofits get their message out to the world. And then finally, we'll have the chance to discuss a book that Matt has just finished writing that will be released uh, probably uh, before you listen to this podcast. It's called 40 Rules for Internet Business Success. And so I'm very excited to have Matt with us on the show. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in and let Matt tell his story. Co-host as usual, Perrin. How you doing? Pretty good. Hey, everybody. Awesome. And uh, we have a special guest today. Actually, um, we have Matt Paulson of MattPaulson.com, who's going to talk to us a little bit about a couple of successful sites that he's had and some of the tactics that he has used to make those sites so successful. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Spencer. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. No, thanks for uh, reaching out. We had actually contacted each other. Boy, it seems like it's been maybe a year ago or so. We exchanged yeah, it's been emails. a while. Yeah, and uh, finally hooked up again. And I wanted to have you on the show because you, you shared with me some of the numbers from some of your sites, and I was quite impressed to say the least. Um, but before we jump into those sites and why they've done so well, I want to hear a little bit of your background. Just briefly tell us your story of how you became an entrepreneur, you know, either from how you went from just being a guy in school to somebody with a successful online business. Sure. So I guess my entrepreneurial spirit really started when I was a kid. I did things like lemonade stands and I collected aluminum cans and sold them. So it's, it must be in my blood. I've had it from kind of day one. (laughs) Um, In like middle school and high school, this would have been like 1995, 1996, kind of those years. I had like a website about SimCity and I had some ads on it and I was getting 25 hits a day and, and back then I was pretty happy with those numbers and I might have made like 25 bucks a month just on some random ad network that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so it was, uh, I, I kind of had the, had, the, had the gene from day one. Um, high school I kind of took a break from doing internet stuff just because I, I got busy with activities and stuff and uh, in college I went to uh, basically computer school for computer science. And then I stuck around for a master's degree after that. Um, kind of when I was in school, I had a lot of free time, um, mm-hmm. so I, I ended up making just some websites. And actually, I started out as kind of a personal finance blogger. Um, so I had a website called just American Consumer News, and I don't update it anymore. But you know, at the time, it was maybe getting a thousand hits a day after you know a year or so, and I was doing pretty well with that. It was making maybe you know fifty grand a year um, after a couple years into it. Um, it was kind of a fun business, but I kind of realized that, you know, I'm not going to be the next J.D. Roth or Trent Ham from the Simple Dollar or any of those people. I just I just don't have it in me. So I realized <laughs> that, you know, if I'm going to gonna do this, i got to find something else to do that I can do better than anyone else. So I kind of really took an inventory of my skill set. It's like, what do I know how to do? What can I do better than anyone else? And um, I, I eventually landed on kind of the investing space. Um, one, because I know some stuff about it. Two, I think I can report on it in ways that other people haven't done so well. And 
you know, I have some good programming skills and some good data analysis and um, automation skills. So I've been able to, you know, take some data and report on it in ways that um, I think are interesting and apparently other people have some well and have as well. And I've really been able to kind of build a funnel from uh, just getting people on my websites to um, onto, you know, an email list and, and selling them stuff uh, down the line. Um, so I've really been doing internet business for you know, kind of in a serious way for seven, eight years. I've been full time with it for two years now, and business is going extremely well. I couldn't be happier. Um, I do three different businesses. Uh, we will certainly talk about those more in a little bit, though. Mm-hmm. And what are those That's businesses, right. Matt? Sure. Um, so there are kind of uh, three main businesses that I have, and uh, the first is kind of the investment news reporting business. I use the brand Analyst Ratings Network. Um, so I get have a few different kind of financial news websites. One of those is AmericanBankingAndMarketNews.com. So I drive a lot of traffic to those through you know a variety of different measures. And then on there, I get an email address and say, "Hey, sign up for my daily newsletter." And um, you know, after they sign up for the newsletter, they you know get offers for like a premium version of the newsletter. So I've got I think 94,000 people signed up for the free newsletter, and then 2,000 people are paying for like a monthly, like the premium version on a monthly basis. So that's going pretty well. Um, the network of financial news websites gets, I think, about two and a half million page views per, per month, so the ad dollars add up pretty quickly there. Um, the other two businesses are, one is called Lightning Releases. It's a press release writing and distribution business, so we help people write press releases, and then we help them you know, get them out to places where people actually see them and read them. Um, that business I started about 18 months ago, and it's taken off pretty well in my, my newest business. It's called GoGo Go Photo Contest, and that uh, organization helps animal shelters and humane societies raise money through uh, photo contest fundraisers. So basically, they run a photo contest. People will pay to submit their uh, you know, pets to the contest, and at the end, whoever gets the most vet votes will get to be in a calendar or something like that. So we've done, I think, 80 of those contests with humane sites around the country. Uh, that business isn't that big yet because we only keep like 5 or 10% of the proceeds. So it's you know we've helped raise 350000 but we haven't really... You know, we made maybe 10% of that. Right. So it's, uh, we're still growing on that one, but uh, those are kind of the three different businesses that I run. Awesome. Very yeah, cool. it sounds like uh, you're doing quite a bit and having quite a bit of success. Mm-hmm. I mean, just with the financial network, I believe uh, you said you have about 2.5 million page views per month. Yep. Um, that gives people an idea of how large um, these sites are. 94,000 free subscribers, 2,000 premium subscribers. So clearly you're uh, doing pretty well there. And we're going to dig into the numbers uh, here in just a second and then talk about how you grew those subscribers and how you've grown the revenue on those sites. Um, would you mind sharing what what is your most profitable website? You mentioned uh, several there. Is, is there one in particular that stands out? Sure. Uh, so certainly the investment reporting business is probably the biggest, but it's actually a network of four or five different sites that kind of work together. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and those are sites, you know, I started AmericanBankingNews.com from scratch and Analyst Ratings Network, and then I've acquired a few more um, that also drive traffic to Analyst Ratings Network. So that's kind of my biggest kind of business unit in terms of revenue overall. But certainly it's it's split up between, you know, affiliate revenue and subscriptions and just, you know, AdSense and display ads and that kind of stuff. And even now we're getting into like doing some dedicated emails um, to our list and those pay quite well, but pretty good as well. Mm-hmm. So so the two biggest URLs or the two big, biggest sites is the AmericanBankingNews.com and is it AnalystRatings.net? Yes. Okay. So And then there's a couple of others associated with that network as well. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So um, – now the big question here: Are you willing to share what the actual monthly income is for um, either that network or a couple of those sites? Sure, I guess I could do that. I'm not okay. ashamed of the numbers or anything. <laughs> um, so the total business gets makes between ninety thousand and one hundred twenty thousand in monthly revenue. Um, probably sixty percent of that comes from kind of the investment news stuff. A lot of that subscriptions, and then you know probably half of it subscriptions. You know, forty percent. You know, another forty percent of that is you know display ads, and ten percent is miscellaneous stuff like email ads and affiliate commissions. So the kind of the investment space that you know makes between you know fifty and sixty a month, and everything else makes you know between forty and fifty a month. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah, the the numbers are great. Yeah. I can't complain about them. <laughs> and 
as far as um, the trajectory of that income, I mean, you said that you've been doing it full time for two years. So uh, has it been steadily increasing or did you kind of explode in the last two years or um, sure. what was the tra- what was the trajectory of that? Okay, so 2009, I made 71000 2010, I made 139000 2011, I made 276000 2012, I made 327 2013, I doubled it to 789 Then this year so far, halfway into the year, I'm at 661 So I'm probably on track to do a million two, a million three this year. So that's a pretty big hockey stick for yeah, someone uh, building with websites, yeah. It's, it's taken a while, but it's uh, you know really starting to explode. I'm it's really starting to leverage, you know, all the relationships and assets that I have, and yeah. just really trying to maximize those. Man, that's awesome. Um, there's a ton of questions that I want to ask, and a lot that we could probably learn. Um, so I'd, I, I know that you have a network of sites, and um, I'm not sure the the best way to approach it. I was thinking maybe we'd just talk about one side. What I'd like to do is is discuss something that is somehow replicable by people listening. You know, um, we want to hear your story of how you started from no website to, to where you are today. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, maybe tell us, well, why did you, I guess you explained a little bit why you created analyst ratings or, or the financial network just because you brought some different things. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, was was there anything in particular that made you want to create you know, that website or that network. Sure. Um, so this story kind of begins in maybe 2009 when I started AmericanBankingNews.com, which is, I think it's, I call it American Banking and Market News. Now, um, that site had picked up really quickly. Um, there are a lot of, like, investing and finance-specific ways to do SEO relating around stock tickers through places like StockTwits and Twitter and Google Finance and a few other places. And I really kind of figured that out pretty early, and I was able to maximize, um, you know, kind of ticker SEO as a source of traffic. Hmm. Um, so that really turned into, um, you know, 2010, you know, after I'd been doing it maybe a year and a half, we were getting maybe a million page views per month. Um, so it was really a way to, um, you know, just produce content at scale and then have, um, you know, that content flow into places, you know, that talk specifically about specific companies that have, you know, stock tickers. And that uh, turned into a lot of traffic pretty quickly, and we were just really able to maximize that. And you know, the the traffic was great, and I knew that uh, it was good ad revenue. But if I I knew that, you know, if I want this to be kind of a sustainable business that sticks around, you know, for the next ten years or so, I'm going to need you know actual customers that are buying products and services for my company on a regular basis. So I didn't want to just stay at the ad revenue. So I kind of started um, the email newsletter, and at first there was just the free newsletter, but then I had get gotten some. A whole bunch of people that said, "Hey, Matt, you know, I really love the newsletter, but I really wish it would had this, or I really wish it was sent earlier in the morning, or I wish it didn't have ads, or I wish I could get email alerts." So I was like, "Hey, maybe there's an opportunity here." So I created mm-hmm. the premium version of the newsletter just based on what people were telling me. And you know, the first six months, I only had maybe a hundred subscribers to that. I just didn't know what I was doing. So 2012 and 2013, I really um, kind of started to figure out the conversion process and really optimizing kind of the opt-in process. And I really looked at kind of, you know, every step of that funnel from when somebody first lands on to one of my websites from a place like StockTwits to when they sign up for the newsletter to the autoresponder series that promotes the premium newsletter to the landing page, to the sign-up page, you know, to even after they become a customer, how can you you really split test and optimize kind of every step of that process. And, you know, we've, we've doubled the opt-in rate on kind of our, um, kind of our opt-in mechanism you know, since we started and, our conversion rates have gone up just based on, you know, really hitting a kind of a product market fit and uh, just really testing the messaging and, you know, really understanding why people sign up. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, certainly been uh, really by working on, on on that funnel and, you know, optimizing every step of the way, we've really been able to, you know, grow that quite a bit. And what if you were going to give, like, two key things that really helped – you start getting those conversions and opt-ins, um, mm-hmm. what would those kind of takeaways be? Because that's something Spencer and I have been struggling with ourselves. Sure. I mean, so I think with opt-ins, the key is to have, um, one, I, I definitely recommend using a pop-up. Um, two, collecting as little information as possible. I guess three, really testing the copy and trying different things out and just testing button text and color and layout and 
Um, I really only collect the email address. I don't collect any other piece of information. I found that that's really all I need, and that's just the best way to uh, um, get people to sign up for your list. So I'll do a, I'll do a pop up, and I show that like I think the twice a week, and then they don't see it for a week. And then uh, I always have another opt-in below the post and then another one um, in the sidebar. So I really just try to catch as many people as I can. And that's uh, seemed to do quite well. If you go to AmericanBankingNews.com and click on one of the articles, you'll kind of see what I do for an opt-in mechanism. And uh, that's worked pretty well for us. I, our pop-up actually looks pretty plain, um, but that's what we found works better than um, having a lot of fancy colors and uh, I don't know. You know stuff that you might see from a, a, a plugin like Pop Up Domination. Yeah. Yep, it is. It's pretty basic. Um, just get the information you need. Yeah, I mean it's pretty much black and white, gray. Um, but yeah, I mean if, if that's all you need, which usually it is, all you need is an email, um, and you optimize for that. That makes sense. So, <clears throat> so obviously, I mean that's that's a huge part of growing the business is optimizing that funnel and driving those into or towards an offer that they can actually purchase things like that having your own product but I'm just thinking of people that are listening here that have have nothing they have no traffic um, you kinda said well you found some tactics that you're able to use with stock ticker symbols mm -hmm. and things like that that's driving a lot of SEO traffic um, are those things that are still working today I'm and is most of your traffic still from free search engine traffic or free sources of traffic? Yeah, those things, they all still work today. Um, the interesting thing about, you know, stock tweets and Twitter and Google Finance and Bing Finance and some of those places and Market Watch and I even got into Yahoo Finance a little bit uh, through social stuff. Um, there's not a Matt Cuts out there out to get you to, um, you know, that's changing the game all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a pretty consistent source of traffic for the last you know, four or five, probably four years now. Um, you know, like Google News and Google Finance, they have different algorithms uh, than the, kind of the main search engine. Mm -hmm. The same is true for Google Images and, you know, some of the other more specialized search engines. And I think people tend to ignore those um, more than they should. I think there's opportunity there. Like if you're having the photography, Google Images, if you do it right, you can get quite a bit of traffic from that. And if you have a new site, Google News is a good opportunity. And um, people ignore Bing and they send quite a bit of traffic to me and you know there's also YouTube and um, you know even, even the iTunes store we have an app that uh, we use to get uh, email signups for as well hmm. I think when people are doing SEO I, I mean the main focus is always getting a ranking for a specific keyword and kind of the main Google search and it's you know maybe that's you know certainly that that works and it's a changing game but there's also all these other you know playgrounds that you can investigate too and I've had you know, substantially more um, success in targeting some of those more specialized things than I have, you know, just with the main Google search. Yeah, so um, just to give us an idea, roughly what percentage of your traffic would you say comes from natural search engine traffic, the traditional, you know, sort of Google traffic versus all these other sources? Um, it's not a big percentage. It's probably less than 20. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't really focus on it at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many people kind of in that in that swimming pool that are vying for the same position that's you know not really something I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm to basically do everything but that. So you know I've got an AdWords campaign and we do co-registration advertising and you know we do um, obviously the new search engines kind of the ticker specific finance search engines. So it's really everything you know but that. I don't even really try to bother um, you know with those because it's you know the amount of money you have to spend and effort you have to put in just to get a ranking and keep it is, um, I think there are better ways to get traffic. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and certainly there's a lot more information that you could share that we just won't have time for. But I do want to dig just a little bit deeper on, you mentioned like stock twits and uh, Twitter, how you're driving some traffic that way using ticker symbols. Can you give us an idea how those work and how you're driving the traffic specifically? Yep. So with uh so with stock tweets and Twitter, they both basically work the same way. Um, Twitter, you know, they have hashtags, but they also have what you call cache tags that are for stocks specifically. Mm. So instead of, you know, you could basically a dollar sign and the ticker symbol. So 
Mm -hmm. Apple would be dollar sign AAPL. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's basically, you know, a tag in your tweet, like a hashtag. And then when anybody searches for that cash tag, my stuff comes up. So I use, you know, we have a big database of kind of stock ratings that come out every day. There's three, 400 that come out, you know, on a daily basis. Um, so I create, you know, just kind of an RSS feed um, um, of all of those ratings changes. And I have kind of like a, a Mad Libs thing where it basically t turns it into a tweet. And then, so it'll be like this brokerage upgraded this stock from a hold rating to a buy rating. They set this price target. So those tweets are pretty easy to write, you know, on an automated fashion. Very and I interesting. Just use, mm -hmm. uh, if this, then that to uh, post it to our Twitter account. Mm -hmm. So our Twitter account for that business is just ratings network. Um, so you can check that out and you can see kind of the content that we're publishing uh, on Twitter and on stock tweets. And so to clarify, all of this is automated. You're not manually doing any of this uh no for the twitter and stock twit stuff you know i we have data sources that we compile and do like a, a sql database mm -hmm. and then that gets turned into an rss feed and then if this then that post it to twitter for yep. us yep no that is awesome that's very cool um that uh maybe you can give some ideas to people out there listening it certainly it'll be different depending on the market that they're in not everybody can use ticker symbols but um mm -hmm. Maybe there's some other ideas, some other takeaways that that people can can do there as well. Um, it sounds like you're you're doing a lot. You're certainly publishing a lot of content. Do you have a large team behind your business now? How many people are involved? Uh, seven or eight, I believe. Um, so I've got, I think, three people that are writing full time. I've got a customer service person, you know, an accounting person, and then uh, a couple of people that help out with kind of software and, and uh, web stuff that when I need them. Yeah, that's one of the questions I was going to ask also is that, I mean, one of the first things you notice when you visit any of your sites is the extreme quality compared to a lot of other stuff out there. I mean, they look like CNN and the New York Times and any other number of uh, quality news sites. So mm -hmm. how did you go about finding your writers and, um, you know, were they a mission critical to your business and when did they come in? Sure. Um, so I found... I found one of my writers in the pro blogger job boards, which is kind of a great place to hire quality people. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the other two I hired when I, I bought, like, they had been writing for a website and then I bought that website and uh, I kept them on. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I got them. Mm -hmm. um, they, two of them write full time for me and one of them writes part time for me. So it's, uh, they produce a lot of content and, you know, they do really good work and, you know, certainly to kind of maintain a position in, you know, Bing News and Google News and Yahoo News and places like that, you really have to have that quality. You can't just, you know, get in by producing crap like a lot of people do. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, so I've, you know, really tried to find some good people that can write consistently and don't need a ton of oversight and just have given them the free reign to, you know, write about financial stuff. And that's uh, uh, gone pretty well. Yeah. Um, just because you mentioned it, I'm curious about acquiring a site to drive traffic to another site. Can you talk about that process? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, basically I've been watching out on Flipper for our sites that are kind of news focused and talk about investing. And I, so um, I think I, I bought three right now. So that site was up for sale and I had bought it because I was already getting, already getting some decent traffic. Um, so I, I bought that site from the guy that, owned it and I really wanted that just so I could get some more email opt-ins. Uh -huh. um, it, uh, it's worked out pretty well. Um, it's, you know, it's a profitable website. It's, you know, we're getting email opt-ins from it. It's uh, gone pretty well. And so basically you bought the site and then just added your own uh, newsletter offer on the existing site, correct? Getting opt-ins yep. opt directly, yeah. Yep, and we're maintaining it and putting new content on it and uh, it's, uh, you know, gone pretty well. And what was the cost of that site, if you don't mind me asking. I'm just curious about, you know, when you have sites making as much as yours, what you're willing to spend on an acquisition just to get more email opt-ins. Sure. It uh, kind of depends on the site. I don't think I can disclose what this specific site was, um, just because mm -hmm. the sales agreement. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I would, I think the most I've ever paid for a site is in the low five figures, and it wasn't this site. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. it's 
it's all you know a multiple of revenue and traffic. It's you know what are you what is the site getting now? You know what's a good you know a good twenty month multiple, and that's basically what you pay. Yeah. Now you're obviously getting traffic from a ton of different sources. I don't know if you mentioned what what is your number one source of traffic? Would you say? Sure. There really isn't a number one. Okay. Um, it's a lot of things, and there are, a lot of them are about the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, it, social, social has been increasingly big. Um, you know, the finance search engines are have always been big. Um, I, I I try to be as diversified as I can, uh, just in traffic acquisition, customer acquisition. Um, I don't want to be too dependent on any one thing. Right. Yeah, no, that's smart. That makes a lot of sense. Um, would you say that uh, like news search engines, Google News and Yahoo News, are are a pretty big chunk of that as well? Certainly. I mean, that's they're a big opportunity, but there's also the requirement of quality and um, just really doing a lot of work to kind of maintain those positions. And you know, they have standards, and you certainly have to meet those. Otherwise, you don't get a stay in. Mm -hmm. And uh, just maybe the final question. I guess I'm not sure here on content for your sites. Um, how, how often are you producing content on these sites? Are, are most of them daily or multi times a day? Sure. They're all, I mean, we publish content to basically all of them every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of them get three, four or five posts a day and it adds up pretty quickly. Um, like on American banking and marketing news, we actually have some, some content that we license and that's, uh, you know, it gets published you know, frequently to our, our blog. So that's a company called, used to be called Grab Networks. I don't, it's called like Blinks now, but they provide us all the video content. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's, that's been kind of a neat relationship to have. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, these are large sites, well-maintained, just to give people an idea. I mean, these have new articles every day or multi-times a day. So, um, it's certainly a large business that requires your management. That's why you have these full-time writers. It's not something that um, can happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but would you still say for people listening out there, somebody that doesn't have a site at all or is just looking to start a site, I mean, is it feasible to, to get where you are? I mean, using either some of the same tactics, um, do you still see a lot of opportunity? I mean, I do. I mean, I started, and the problem is it takes time and it takes a lot of work. Yeah, and most people that you know want to do internet business want the easy button. They want to, you know, start something and be making money on day one. This was a you know, a seven year ramp up to get where I am today. Mm -hmm. and yep. I've been working you know forty fifty hours a week every week since then to you know to get where I am today. So it's there's it, it can be done certainly, and I think the a lot of the the tactics and strategies that I use, and whether that be you know the how I acquire traffic or email marketing or you know doing a, a newsletter or anything like that. I think all of those are still valid, you know, strategies today. It's just, you know, are you willing to put into work to make that happen? And you know, a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Very true. Um, are there any other marketing methods that you're using to drive traffic or just raise awareness about your sites right now that we haven't sure. discussed that you'd like to? Yeah, email marketing has been big for um, our Google Photo Contest business. Okay. Uh, so I think email marketing works really well when you can find a list of people or compile a list of uh, targeted people pretty easily. Um, so we know that um, we can do photo contests for basically animal shelters and humane societies of certain sizes. So we, you know, our goal has been to find as many of those as we can, and then we put them on, you know, an autoresponder series to uh, let them know about our product and provide them fundraising tips and some of those things. So, you know, we've done 80 contests and. You know, 60 of those have come as a result of you know, the email marketing efforts that we've done. Um, so, you know, we don't try to spam people. We send maybe one, two emails a month just to kind of bring some awareness and saying, hey, we're out here if you're interested. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's, I think that's a, it's an underutilized opportunity to uh, market to people when you don't have a big audience that exists already. That's a really good idea. And so are you getting those emails just by researching animal shelters uh, or humane societies and then taking their emails and putting them on a list? Yeah, so the uh, neat thing about that particular industry is there are all of these, you know, find a shelter directories. Mm, um, so yeah. they, list, they list out shelters and it's, you know, pretty easy to add them to a list, you know, by going through those directories. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And it, I mean, was there a process of finding a decision maker, or did you just take whatever email was there and put and use that one? Sure. So typically, they're relatively small organizations. So if there's an email address, either they are the decision maker or their boss is the decision maker. So it's uh, you know not hard to find a person that get to the person that does the fundraising and. Um, you know, my business partners are pretty connected in uh, you know, kind of animal shelter and humane society world as it, as it is. So we're not some some you know unknown quantity that's you know trying to approach yeah. approach them out of the blue or kind of a name that you know we have a lot of references and testimonials. So when people come to our website for the first time, it's not as big of a, a step up in establishing trust. Yeah, right. Awesome. Um... I want to backtrack just a little bit and talk about your other sites, um, your financial network that you have. And I know that you said SEO is not a huge part of your business, probably less than uh, 20% of your traffic con comes from search engines. Um, but do you have any be best practices um, that you'd like to share or is most of it just very natural traffic that comes be because you're producing so much content? Sure. I mean, for SEO, my best practice is not really worrying about SEO, and it's mm -hmm. you know trying to do everything but SEO to acquire customers. You know, I don't want to be in the ball game where the rules are changing. You know, every inning of the game. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, you know, any anything that seems like it could possibly be a good profitable source of traffic, I'll test and I'll try it. And if it, you know, if the first time if it's almost profitable, I'll optimize it so it is profitable. Profitable. Um, so recently, like we've started doing like Twitter advertising and getting people to follow our ratings network account, and they have like a Twitter card where you can click one button and get people on your email list. So we've been testing that, and hmm. um, we've been testing just a little bit of everything. And just you know, when something works, we kind of add it to our arsenal of tra traffic acquisition strategies. So I mean, certainly SEO is important, but it's um, the traditional Google search SEO is not you know where I want to put all put much of my energy. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, but have you ever done any type of, or are you doing any type of link building or anything else to increase your visibility in Google, or it, it really is pretty hands off? Um, it is. It's pretty hands off. We don't do any link building, um, you know, for any of my main sites. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with uh, just being, you know, kind of news organizations. Um, you know, we we attract links pretty naturally, and that's. I, I don't see a ton of benefit in to try to you know build links to our websites because I'd rather just have that happen naturally. Right. And certainly, if you're building you know a smaller niche site, that's a different ball game, and uh, you need to approach that accordingly. But for what we do, SEO has not been you know a big focus, and I don't know that it's ever going to be. Sure. And then uh, the the final related question to this, as far as content um, and SEO. Are you targeting any type of keywords at all specifically with your articles that you write or again is it just more news reporting and, and natural writing? Sure. So we like to write about kind of bigger companies mm -hmm. uh, because certainly more people will be looking for those in places you know that do the ticker kind of SEO. Um, so certainly if we write about Apple it's going to get you know more um, traffic than you know kind of a no-name company that nobody's ever heard of. Right. Um, so we, you know, we kind of know um, based on data that we collect which companies we get the most traction from, and we kind of report on those, you know, more than others. Gotcha. But it's it's very different than you know which uh, keyword you might most easily rank in Google for. It's more based on the data that you know uh, from Twitter and stock twits and and other places you know you can get traffic from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 more based on what type of what companies are people most interested in, and mm -hmm. then we write about those. Yeah, very interesting. No, that's very cool. Um, an awesome business. Uh, it's huge, doing very well. So congrats on that. Thank you. And uh, I think you shared some good tips, uh, Parent. Did you have any follow up questions? I mean, there's a ton that we could go into, and I wish we had a lot more time to pick your brain. But um, yeah, anything I else you have, Parent? I kind of do. I uh, I just have one. So this is something that I've seen some bigger websites do, and something that you are obviously doing. And I'm really curious about um, the strategy behind it. But you have a a, a network of sites um, that are all working together, and I was wondering how they do that, and what's the benefit of having a network of sites 
all kind of working towards the same goal. Sure. Um, so really, all my new sites are kind of a funnel back down to Analyst Trading's network. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's you know it's not a matter of one site does something that you know another doesn't. It's you know it's just I picked them up over the last few years and they all have get certain traffic and all do cover you know certain things you know better than others and it's um, you know really you know the advertising revenue is certainly good and then it's really just you know, all of my new sites are a funnel back to my subscription newsletter business to get people kind of on the free email list. Because I know that, like, whenever somebody signs up for my list, they're going to be worth, you know, 6 or $7 to me over the course of two years. Mm-hmm. So it's, if I can get anybody on that list for less than $6, certainly I want to, um, you know, if they're targeted traffic, I certainly want to pay for that. And, um, you know, having a network of new sites that, you know, drive traffic, you know, to the um, newsletter is, you know, kind of how that works. So how does... I mean, how can you get away with sending one newsletter to email signups from a bunch of different sites? Is it just because the content is related? Yeah. Um, so, like on a pop up, it'll say subscribe to American Banking News and Analyst Ratings Network's daily, daily email newsletter. So, it, you know, kind of gotcha. in the copy, I try to make it sound like they're part of the same company, which they obviously are. Yeah. Um, it's really never been an issue that, you know, I'm using two separate brands. Um, for kind of the reporting and then the subscription business. I think uh, there's another company called Benzinga that does something similar. They have a, you know, they have got a big financial news website and then they've got um, a business called MarketFi that uh, um, is all kind of their paid products and, you know, the people kind of know they're related so it's not really that big of an issue. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, now, I know, Matt, that you're also in the process of releasing your very first book, mm-hmm. um, and I wanted to give you a chance to just tell us a little bit about that book. Uh, sure. So I was going to an entrepreneurial event, you know, I think six months ago now, actually maybe a little bit less than that, but uh, somebody had, had said they had written a book, and then like the next week at the same event, someone else said they had written a book, and I was like, you know, these people don't know anything that I don't. I could write a book. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to write a book. Absolutely. So the uh, title of the book is 40 Rules for Internet Business Success. So it's basically kind of all of the lessons that I've learned uh, during the last seven or eight years building my internet businesses um, so that people that are reading the book can uh, grow their businesses faster and just avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. Um, So I'm selling it on Amazon. It'll be out July 21st, 2014. So if you are listening to this podcast after that date, you can go to 40rulesbook.com. And then you'll get redirected to Amazon to find the book or read it on Kindle or you'll be able to get a print copy as well. And uh, can you share with us maybe your favorite or one of your favorite rules for internet business success from your book? Sure. So I think uh, you know, for audience like yours and you know, Pat Flynn's and people that listen to like Entrepreneur on Fire, the, mm-hmm. the lesson that I think applies the most is to not be a franchisee of somebody else's business model. So, I mean, how many podcasts are there out right now that are business interview podcasts that are be- trying to be exactly like Entrepreneur on Fire? Yep, oh, totally. You, you, you just can't do that. You have to be original and really kind of forge your own path because your strengths are going to be different than Pat Flynn's strengths. They're going to be different than Johnny Dumas's strengths. And the reality is you just don't have the relationships that they do. So you can't, you can't expect to copy them and get the same success that they are. And you really have to use your strengths and your abilities and your relationships to kind of forge your own path. Yeah, I agree with that advice 110%. Um, I say the same thing all the time in a slightly different manner, but same point, you have to be your own person. You have to go out, develop your own strategies. You can't copy people to success. You you really do have to ha- bring something original to the table. So, yeah. You know that with your, uh, you're like a, a knife site that somebody copied, right? Yes, somebody definitely, <laughs> not only just somebody, but uh, several somebodies. Several somebodies, and I'm yeah. guessing that none of them you know, made it to the traffic level that you made it to. Yeah, no, we actually talked about that in a couple of previous podcasts. About I mean, it, was, it was one of the nine mistakes in our nine mistakes of uh, SEO and building niche sites. It's, you know, you can't, right. you can't just paint by number. It, uh, yep. that's, that's not how business works, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah gonna, absolutely. I think that goes back just to having you know, a defensible business that's, you know, not as easily copyable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know whether that you have you know whether or not you have some software or some relationships or some traffic acquisition strategies that people can't copy easily. You know, I've tried to build businesses that you know somebody listening to this podcast 
couldn't just go out and copy in, in you know, a month or two. And that's uh, worked out pretty well for me, mm-hmm. which, you know, enables me to, you know, talk more freely about kind of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's definitely worked out very well for you, um, as you've shared the numbers with us from your business. So we appreciate that. Um, I tell you what, it's got me fired up. I want to go out and uh, create something that's getting two and a half million page views. Um, That would be awesome to check out those numbers each month for sure. Um, So, so yeah, I'm fired up. Hopefully people listening um, are excited to just really realizing what is possible uh, with an online business. Um, You know, I've had success in my own way with my niche sites and certainly Longtail Pro is doing very well in other areas of my business. Uh, Matt has shared his story with how he's uh, doing well in a different way. Um, And so there's lots of different avenues that you could go. Um, Hopefully people just take some action and make things happen for themselves. Uh, For people that are interested in following along with what you're doing, Matt, do you have a blog or other place that you'd like to send people to follow along? Yep, I uh, I blog about entrepreneurship on my website. It's uh, mattpaulson.com. Paulson is P-A-U-L-S-O-N, and I'm sure you will link to that in the show notes as well. Yep. And my uh, Twitter ID is Matthew D P D S and Dog P as and Pony. Uh, so feel free to follow me there as well, and I often you know write stuff about entrepreneurship there too. Awesome. Very good. So I will indeed link to those in the show notes, um, along with some of the other things that you mentioned here on the podcast. So. Yeah, I just want to thank you so much for your time, for coming on and sharing the numbers and all the details of your business. Like I said, very inspiring, hopefully, as well for people listening out there. Um, Any last parting words that you'd like to share? Buy my book when it comes out on July 21st. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure um, it's got 40 points. You shared one that was really good. I'm sure the other 39 are just as good. So. So absolutely, once again, thank you so much and best of luck to you and also best of luck to everyone else listening in out there. Thank you very much.